Recorded live at Tox and Tasting Studios, it's the Clerical Errors Podcast. The podcast that shows you what's behind the collar. Let's go. From the Tox and Tasting Studios, this is the Clerical Errors Podcast. The podcast that shows you what's behind the collar. This is Bullhagen. This is Berg. And I'm Vicker. Peter's here. Hey, Pete. All ready to go. I'm excited. We got a top 12 list. And uh, one thing uh, I wanted to mention, we got a, a precious email from our associate producer about uh, the mount- announcing of a birth of a beautiful child, I assume, in a hospital. And <laughs> <laughs> why is that funny? <laughs> um, and uh, list- longtime listeners will laugh at that. Um, and uh, we didn't say anything about it. We failed. Sorry, Hannah. Um, I'll, I'll, I would text you a response, but you, you listen. So, sorry, Hannah. Congratulations on your your baptized little boy, baptized yeah. this past Sunday. God be praised. Yes. Um, Berg, uh, I'm surprised you didn't ask the show to be one of our sponsors. <laughs> I mean, you know, what do you think? that would have been awesome. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? Like, have the, the certificate say the Clerical Heirs Podcast. Yep. And I'd sign it, the show that shows you what's behind the collar. Nice. <laughs> I'm going to be in Fort Wayne, so we're recording a little early. I'm going to the Vicarage Supervisors Conference so I can nice. learn how to do this. Kind of. You've only do- done it for, what, less than a little less than 20 years now? Yeah. This is this is on helping the, the vicar learn to preach. So. Oh, who's, uh, who's, who's running that? Um... You know I don't read ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I like to be surprised. Every day is a little bit of a surprise, surprise to me. I walk in on Sunday, I look at uh, our office manager and say, hey, what, what am I doing this week? <laughs> yeah, you are very spontaneous. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, maybe uh, see if I get recognized by any listeners. There's, there I wonder, go. is uh, the, the musician, is he, uh, is he there or is he, in for, is he on Vicarage? He's on Vicarage right now. Oh, he missed me. Oh, well. Anyways. I mean, it's a Vicarage conference, so maybe he'll be back, right? Not, well, not unless things are going very right. badly for him. He should still be if, he, he, <laughs> <laughs> if he's back, then he might still have a chance to be my Vicar next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would have been interesting, wouldn't it? That would have been very funny, yeah. <laughs> so right. since so since you're going to be gone, uh, is Vicar preaching for the first time, or are you going to be back? Or I'll I'll be back on I'll, I'm coming back on Saturday, so. But Vicar's already preached twice. Nice, so. living the dream. Yeah. So by the way, uh, I am drinking uh, some Isla Scotch. Ooh. Anybody else? I've got my uh, Glen Livet. Living the dream, living the dream, and I just have a. A blue moon. And I've got uh, a Bella V bold cherry lime. I'm such a lightweight anymore. So, well, you know, God has, uh, God has really made you ethical by this, uh, <laughs> by this dietary restriction stuff. Well, you know, I, I've noticed, uh, um, I am a little more ripped. You know, I can, uh, I can see, uh, the muscle definition a little more since I've been on this diet. So, 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 so God takes away with one hand and then he gives you pecs on the other, right? That's right. It all works. <laughs> right. That's right. I, I showed uh, Vicar <laughs> the other day how to do the wave. I know he's been practicing or not, but. Yeah, I've got a while to go for that. <laughs> do you know what the wave is? <laughs> is if you, if you flex your pecs just right, you get this line that starts at the bottom of your pec and just kind of goes all the way up. It's pretty amazing. Uh, f- uh, if you want to see that, uh, what's our Patreon, Peter? <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any takers to see my esophagus? <laughs> uh, not that I've seen. Okay. <laughs> hey, so, hey, okay. So, so what are we preaching on? I guess. <laughs> that's we exactly should, right, right. <laughs> Yeah, Moving you know, on. we should probably like, you know, I don't know, talk about the Bible or something. <laughs> uh, we are. Yeah. Sometimes our errors are over outshine our clerical. So, Vicar, what's the text for this Sunday? Our text is the gospel according to Luke in chapter 7. It's the raising of the widow of Nain's son. 
All right. Uh, would you like to, uh, it's short, want to read it? Yeah, I'll read it. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearer stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. So a uh, uh, typical, uh, not a typical, it's a wonderful uh, m- miracle of Jesus having compassion, uh, raising uh, the woman's son. Um, this is uh, another one of the miracles where we you see Jesus having compassion. Berg, do you know if this is moved in the guts of compassion? Um, let me, uh, I can look it up quick. Give me one minute. Hey, Vicar, while he looks at while he looks it up, do you think the speakers in my office are a little uh, too much? I don't know if I'd say they're too much, but they're <laughs> they're getting close to being overkill. <laughs> <laughs> um, Luke, what was it again? Seven, Seven? versus okay. uh, verse eleven. Verse 11. Or, sorry, twelve. Yep, it's esplaginsthe. So yeah, of the guts, right? He was moved with compassion. He felt it in his guts. Yeah. So he has compassion, and uh, he raises the son. And uh, the people's response is, uh, surely a great prophet. How, exactly how does he word it there, Vicar? You have it in front of you. Uh, they said, uh, fear sees them all, and they all glorify God, saying, a great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. What I find interesting is, is the fact that what does a prophet do? A prophet also he does miracles, but ultimately he speaks on behalf of of the people of the people. So their takeaway was the fact that hey, maybe we should listen to them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I did the but Berg, did you catch? It? I did the Iowa hay. <laughs> do you know what the Iowa hay is? Yes, yes, I do. <laughs> I did it. Hey. Maybe we should listen to him. <laughs> and I was thinking, hey, help me out, Berg. I'm discombobulated. Well, I think there's definitely a lot of things we can talk about here. Um, this is actually, you know, you said typical at the beginning, and I agree. This is a type. Um, this is a type of what is going to happen on the last day um, for all flesh, right? So it teaches the third article. Uh, I believe in the resurrection of the body. Uh, this is why we treat our dead uh, in the way that we do, with respect, just as they treated this dead son. Uh, we know that the Bible teaches that there will be a resurrection of all flesh, uh, some to eternal life and some to eternal condemnation. So I, if you wanted to go catechetical, I would focus on that. Um, mm-hmm. I would also focus on maybe confession. Um, you have two very interesting Confessions, right? A great prophet has arisen among the people, and God has visited his people. The question is, do these people actually believe that Jesus is the prophet promised by Moses, or is he just a prophet? And then secondly, while God has visited his people, does that mean Jesus is God, or has God visited his people through Jesus? Right. So even though these seem like good confessions, um, it's like they're not quite putting together the, you know, the, the Legos yet. Well, what, what I kind of find interesting about this, this um, miracle is the fact that Jesus doesn't come and say, do you believe? He doesn't, he's not requiring faith here. He just comes up and says, rise, get up. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's sorry, interesting that the juxtaposition between being moved with compassion And then his words to her, don't cry, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, when you have compassion on people, you usually, you know, I don't know, don't tell them things like that. 
<laughs> um, well, yeah, what's well, that's interesting though is he tells her don't cry, and then he, right, do you know what Jesus did right before he raised Lazarus from the dead? He cried. He wept. <laughs> yeah, he right. Cried. I mean, so it's interesting here how um, I think too at funerals this means that we shouldn't judge by appearance, right? Um, mm -hmm. That. Here, Jesus tells her not to sob, to cry, to wail, to mourn, lament. Probably because she was mourning as one who had no hope. She was a widow. She had lost her only son. And so not only did she lose her family name in Israel, but she also uh, was going to be in pretty big trouble as a widow. Because she had no financial backing. Right. And so I'm sure that she was mourning like one who had no hope. And I think that's why Jesus says what he does. As opposed to what he does with Mary Magdalene and, uh, and her sister, Martha. He doesn't tell mm -hmm. them to stop crying. And in fact, he himself weeps there. Uh, so why does he tell this woman not to weep? Well, I think this also should teach us that... Uh, we should mourn at funerals. We shouldn't... I mean, nobody was calling this a celebration of life, so to speak. <laughs> right? right? I mean, right. like, this was, this was yeah. terrible. Death is an enemy. Death is evil. Death is the last enemy to be right. destroyed. And it's okay to cry. At the same token, we don't want to... We don't also want people to mourn like those who don't have any hope. And that's what we get from Paul and... First Thessalonians chapter four, for example. So, like, I, I mean, I don't know. I think if someone would have told uh, yeah, told us, thing. you know, not to cry when our daughter died, I think I probably would have punched him in the face. You know. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think those words, especially if you've lost a child, are shocking, and preachers would do well to actually, you know, <laughs> deal with this juxtaposition of, yeah, Jesus actually does feel compassion here. And his compassion moves him to the right thing. And the right thing here is to chastise her for for mourning like one who doesn't have any hope. No hope in the resurrection. And that might seem cold, but it's not. It's actually loving. It's actually compassion. I actually had this discussion a little bit with Vicar. Um, we were talking about preaching um, and kind of presence in the pulpit and how um, people, when they hear a sermon— who, of someone who speaks with confidence and authority and compassion at the same time, that people find that very comforting and even disarming. A voice of saying, you know, this is what, what happened, this is what God does. And sometimes if you try and, and that is... And I see, you see that you've probably seen this Berg in, at the end of life times where someone dies and then everyone's talking quietly and, and, and oh, it's so sad. But to, to hear, uh, and then the pastor comes and says, you know, the, he is alive in Christ forever. And, and to pray with a, a calming kind of a powerful voice uh, is often what's needed. And it goes back to my, my saying. <laughs> what's my saying I taught you, Vicar? <laughs> Say it with your chest. No, no, the other one. God wanted. Oh yeah, God. God wants men more than just because of their parts <laughs> to be to be pastors. To be pastors, yeah. <laughs> so, what's this talking with your chest? Is this like on blood sport where the dude like does the thing with his pecs? Uh, oh no. Although I I like that. <laughs> um, uh, that is that that is why the robes keep me from sinning because I wear a robe and a stole so that it, my chest is covered. Otherwise, I would probably make it all about my pecs. Uh, he gets so distracted during the sermon, right? <laughs> so, uh, but I, but I wanted to get back to another point of this too. Is uh, what is something that the congregation would need to hear from this? And I would say, looking at Christ's compassion and genuine love, we as a church speak on behalf of Christ to the world. And if that love that Jesus had for this, his neighbor, uh, that he felt in his guts, um, that should also lead us who uh, 
our Christ here, we are the body of Christ, should lead us to have compassion on people who are in the same kind of boat. Yeah, and that compassion doesn't necessarily mean indulging them too and letting them wallow. And I think right. that's, you know, that's the important point because, you know, I've heard stories about, you know, terrible things where you lose children in the, you know, kind of in the flower of their life and it's it's just terrible. And this is where, like, encouraging them to actual faith away from their grief is a very, very important um, mm -hmm. because... Yeah, you should grieve. You're going to grieve the rest of your life. But once again, we don't grieve like those without any hope. And that can only be given by the Spirit of God. I mean, unfortunately, you know, there are some people out there who believe that, oh, well, if I, you know, just pray hard enough or whatever, my, my loved ones will be resurrected now in this life. And it's, God can do anything, but he's probably not going to do it. Right? He's going to raise them on the last day. And right, so. Yeah. God didn't raise uh, our Lord Jesus didn't raise every dead body in Judea, but he was he. But at the same time, he was moved, in right? Compassion. And that compassion then is shown most clearly in the cross. And we know that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And yeah, I mean, I, I could see where this text might be very, very uncomfortable because, well, why did the widow of Nain get that? Why don't I get that? Because she didn't even ask for it. <laughs> yeah, you know. So, and yet he had compassion. So, and he has compassion on us today. And we will receive our loved ones back again. There's also some third article stuff in, in this too. And in, in the fact that uh, uh, as Christ raised this man from death, his son, uh, it was by the power of his word. I mean, he couldn't do anything. Something had to come to him to give him life. And, and in bapti baptism, we are buried with Christ. We are raised. It is uh, a new life given from our death. And uh, we can place ourselves also in the place of, of that man that, that Jesus came and rose uh, by his power and authority because he is a great prophet. God has visited. The mark of God is the fact that he raises from the dead. He gives faith through the Holy Spirit. Uh I think you can see that in this text too, can't you, Berg? Yeah, yeah. I think that is a further application because if Ephesians 2 says that we are dead in our sins and trespasses, well, what does a dead man do? Rot? Uh, nothing. You know, he's being carried out on a bier to his grave. Jesus does it all. And this is why it is so frustrating uh, sometimes to talk to our misguided American evangelical friends who are good Christians, but they're just, they've been deceived on this. I actually went through and I started making a list of all the verses that say that, you know, God alone is the author of conversion and also on original sin. And <laughs> I mean, there's just a ton. There's just, there's so many verses right. that teach this time and time again. I mean, it, it's just, you know, like, they call it, you know, and then you hear them talk about being born again Christians. It's like, read the text. If you're born again, well, uh, did you choose to be born the first time? Right. So. Yeah, or Ezekiel 37 is great at that, the Valley of the Dry Bones. Exactly. Very dry. Yeah, <laughs> there's no life in them whatsoever. Right. So. So, Vicar, do you, do you an idea if it was uh, someone young or old, like a bigger guy, this son was raised? Because I, I want to know if I'm trying to figure out if it's a light beer or not. Ah, oh my goodness! But um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, well, I'm okay. excited. We got to move I, on. I, right? I can actually tell you, it says a neon neonistas, a, a young man. A youth. So it would have been a light so beer. So it would have been a light beer. There okay. you go. It would have been a light. Yeah. Okay. You got it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so we haven't had too many uh, top 12 lists from Berg. And uh, we had a, we talked a little yesterday, and he said, he said I want to do a top 12 list. And he delivered. I do what I can.
So uh, what do you think uh, should happen? Do I have to draw this out every time? Like, hey, Vicar, what should we do? What what should happen next? Hey, uh, <laughs> hey, Peter, play the intro. <laughs> Enough nonsense. It's time for Bullhagen's Top 12. It's like I have to I have to hold the vicar's hand, walk him through. Okay, vicar, what's next? We only do this once a week. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, what do you think of that music? It's what do you think of that music, vicar? Splendid. Uh, all right. <laughs> so, tell us about your top twelve list, Berg. All right. So this is a top twelve. Biblical arguments from Luther's Invocavit sermons on patient teaching and waiting. So uh, mm-hmm. I wrote a little introduction just to get us into it. So how quickly? Sh- by the, by, oh, by the go way, go ahead. Wait, wait, wait. Before you do that, I, I got to make this clerical error style. I want you to compare this to my top twelve list from last week, which where I just threw together football terms in church. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is <laughs> this is a little little. Uh, a little different. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm excited, though. Go ahead, Berg. Fire away. All right. So I wrote up a little introduction, so we'll start with that. How quickly should a pastor change things in a congregation? This was also the problem of the Reformation. In December 1521, Luther returned secretly to Wittenberg from the Wartburg for a three-day conference on how to meet the turbulence and confusion caused by the radical reformers. Soon after his return to the Wartburg, Karl Stott put himself at the head of those who favored immediate abolition of Roman practices. At Christmas, Karl Stott administered communion in two kinds for the first time in the parish church, um, which, you know, we would all say is a good thing. Karl Stott mm-hmm. also declared that confession before communion was unnecessary. We would also say that, yeah, you shouldn't uh, turn confession into a torture. However, he continued and said that images were not allowable in the church— Uh, That's not so good. And that rules of fasting were not binding. That's okay. And this led to Mm -hmm. outbreaks of actual destruction of images and altars in Wittenberg. And that's El Bado. Uh, Karl Karl Stott also taught the doctrine of the direct illumination by the Spirit. That meant that the Spirit talked directly to people, uh, which made scholarship and learning unnecessary for the understanding of the Scriptures. So, Vicar, you're just wasting your time. The consequence was that the city schools were closed and the university was threatened with collapse. So, some good, some bad, some very, very ugly things are happening in Wittenberg. So how did Luther deal with the turmoil of these times? On March 9th, in Volkavit Sunday, he mounted the pulpit in the parish church and preached each day from the 9th to the 16th. This remarkable series of sermons, which are powerful, inspired preaching of the gospel, had the effect of restoring tranquility and order almost at once. His task was to lead his congregation away from fanatical enthusiasm back to the spirit of the gospel and to answer the questions that were agitating his people in the light of the gospel. And so if you want to go on and read the Invocavit sermons for yourself, they are in Luther's works, volume 51. So I think you can either get that on Kindle or you can actually order it from CPH. If you so desire, they are beautiful, beautiful sermons uh, that um, I think everyone should have on on their shelf. I mean, they're just wonderful. So, so w- would you think that this should be a, a staple in fourth year seminary training? Yeah, I mean, I think for Ham three, actually taking the Invocavit sermons, and we can do a little bit of this with this top twelve, um, and actually talk about how Luther is preaching some of this stuff. Uh, he doesn't actually preach very textually. He pre- preaches very thematically with this series of sermons. And uh, we'll get that uh, actually in our first uh, one that we do. Um, Now, just to let you know, these are uh, done chronologically. Uh, They're not in any particular order. So number 12 is really the beginning of the sermon. Number one is at the end. So number 12. The summons of death comes to us all and no one can die for another. Everyone must fight his own battle with death by himself alone. We can shout into another's ears, but everyone must himself be prepared for the time of death, for I will not be with you then, nor you with me. Therefore, everyone must himself know and be armed with the chief things which concern a Christian. This is actually a 
a great way to talk about um it's a, it's actually a great thing to talk about today because of our our gospel text with the widow at Nain. I'm sure the widow would have mm-hmm. gladly traded places with her son. Every parent would love to die for their children, give up their life. But you can't, mm-hmm. right? You can't die mm-hmm. for another. And so what Luther here is bringing up is personal faith. Every Christian must be prepared to die. And all of us are going to die alone. No one can die for someone else. I can shout into your ears, but you actually have to believe the things and be certain and persuaded of the things that Christians should be should know and be persuaded of. You can't just say, that, that's, you know, I'm I'm a Missouri I'm a card carrying Missouri Senate member. Oh, what do they believe? I don't know. And that's that's not something that can come by force. No, no. And I think you know, for them, and especially for Luther in this regard, you know, he had just been outlawed, which means anyone could kill him on sight without any sort of. Uh, punishment because that's what being an outlaw meant it mean and meant being outside the law anyone could kill Luther on site and and suffer no punishment for it and not only that but the Wittenbergers themselves it's like okay is the emperor going to invade our territory um, look at all the violence and destruction that's going on in Wittenberg because of the preaching of the gospel you know they're smashing altars they're uh, you know tearing down statues what happens if they start doing that to my house? I mean, mm-hmm. so this is the thing. This was front and center for them. And really, it should be front and center for us. I think COVID actually did a good job of bringing up that, hey, look, everybody's going to die. You need to be prepared for it. <laughs> because we don't th- right. we don't think that way. I mean, they were much more acquainted with death than we are. The plagues went through. Um, One third of children died before they reached the age of 18 in in the 1520s. I mean, so I think oftentimes we are so separated from death that we often don't think about it. We don't realize it. Sometimes the first time that a kid goes to a funeral is when he's in his 20s. And, you know, then then it's really shocking when it's like, oh, yeah, I am going to die one day. Think of it this way. Imagine if uh, your goal in life was to not die that day. Like, every day you're batting a thousand. <laughs> exactly. Think of how happy you'd be. <laughs> yeah. Or Did it again. Or, you know, I mean, think about it. We can just run to the grocery store. We've got freezers. We've got canned goods. We've got all this stuff. Well, I mean, imagine being these guys where it's like, okay, well, maybe I won't be able to run to the store. Maybe I won't have the money for it. Maybe uh, the harvest isn't that great, and I, I only have two months of food instead of three saved up. You know, I, life was much more difficult and much more precarious. Same, But the thing is, is that can all happen to us too. It's like, look at the supply chain issues where we ran out of things like toilet paper, right? Yeah, I, I do see this also in, in a lot of our in our Lutheran hymnody is, is the fact that uh, I think sometimes in the, when people hear some of our great Lutheran hymns, there's a little bit of a disconnect Mm -hmm. because there's a lot of, there's always the deathbed verse or there's like some pretty powerful things that talk about death and illness and all sorts of things that was probably more on their mind than they are on ours. Right. I mean, you go out to old cemeteries. I'm, you know, I know Trinity has one. Maybe Vicar hasn't been out there yet. I need to take you. Remind me. Yeah, okay. take him out there. Yeah. I bet you guys have infants in there too. Oh yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, this was just this is just the way it was. I mean, I don't think we realize. You know, science is both a bane and a blessing, right? Because women don't die in childbirth like they used to. Thanks be to God. At the same mm-hmm. time. Uh, <laughs> it can actually keep us from thinking about eternal realities. And I think that's where Luther really focuses us in on this. It's like, look, you're going to die. You got to be prepared for it. So. All right. Yeah. So um, obviously this doesn't have really much to do with the Invocavit text, which is about the temptation of Christ. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> so um, we definitely see that here Luther is preaching thematically and not very textually, um, which, you know, he is dealing which, with particular problems at a particular right. time. So this it's is good for it's good for for Luther, not good for a vicar yet. Yeah, and I would <laughs> Don't say get any ideas. You know that uh, if there is a particular thing that happens in a congregation, I mean, things that upturn everything. I mean, uh, perhaps that Sunday you actually do preach on something that is very relevant. Number eleven. After speaking of sin and grace, so, uh, you know, uh, these are the first two points that he makes that a Christian needs to know that we are lost and condemned in sin and that we have been given grace because of what Christ did on the cross. And, he's, and he says, he ends up saying there, hey, look, you, you know, you guys have heard this, right? You guys know this stuff. You know sin and you know grace. But then Luther brings up the third point of Christian doctrine. And he says, thirdly, we must also have love. And through love, we must do to one another as God has done to us through faith. For without love, faith is nothing. As St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, If I had the tongues of angels and could speak of the highest things in faith and have not love, I am nothing. And here, dear friends, have you not grievously failed? I see no signs of love among you, and I observe very well that you have not been grateful to God for his rich gifts and treasures. Oof. <laughs> right. Right? I mean, this is where, like, the hammer comes down. It's like, look, there's sin, there's grace, but there's also love. And boy, you guys aren't very loving. And this is what the Bible says. First Corinthians mm -hmm. 13, right? If I could speak of the highest things of faith and have not love, I am nothing. Um, I think that's something that, unfortunately, a lot of uh, preachers are afraid to do, to speak about love and even the failings of their congregations in regard to love. Uh, yeah, that, he that, says, I, I, if I may, may interrupt for a second, please. There, there is always been a hesitancy. Like there have been times where I've, I've had discussions with people and I, I get the feeling that what Luther says, they would say, well, isn't that kind of. In a sermon, you're violating the law gospel thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Where oh, yeah. there's a there's a third. Well, you're only supposed to talk about the law when you're condemning people of their sin, uh, not after the redemption. Which he's actually doing both. You're redeemed, <laughs> right? But you're not. Your love is failing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, our gospel lesson for last Sunday um, on the three year was Matthew 18. The the uh, the, the servant who owes his master 10,000 talents, which is like 200,000 years of wages. And his master forgives him that. And what does he do? He goes and chokes and beats up and throws into jail a guy who owes him 100 denarii, right? Which is still a substantial sum, but still. Um, and then what does the master do? Throws the other it, dude in jail, right? Yeah, so, that's not the one where he cut him in pieces, is it? Not, <laughs> No, not that one. <laughs> okay. But there, I mean, I think there is, like, there is a third use of the law. There is. Like, sanctification is a real thing. And sanctification also shows either a deficiency in faith or a lack of faith. And I think this is what Luther is getting to. Hey, look, we've preached these other things to you. Well, why don't you have love? Like, and he says it, I see no signs of love among you. I mean, that's, <laughs> can you imagine uh, people, <laughs> pastors saying that today? I mean, I, like, this is, like, this is powerful preaching. There's a reason why Luther was the reformer. Mm -hmm. You know, he was willing to call a spade a spade. Um, so, you know, and he brings it back to, I observe very well that you have not been grateful to God for his rich gifts and treasures. And so it comes back to faith. It's like, look, the reason why you don't love is because you really don't have faith. You're not grateful for what God has done for you. Or you don't believe that it's much at all. So, hmm. you have any more to say there? Uh, no. No, I think... Uh, are you going to uh, bring it up? Are you going to bring this up at the vicarage deal on preaching? <laughs> sure. <laughs> 
<laughs> sure. I mean, I'm except I'm going to veil it. I'm I'm going to be the one is well, brother uh, pastors. I I don't see any love in this room right now. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I observe very well that you're not grateful to God for his treasures and gifts. <laughs> <laughs> it's, been, it's because you don't believe. Uh, that's funny. This is why God gave you the vicar that you have. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. <ba-dum-tsh. laughs> Ooh. But yeah, I mean, here we actually find preaching on sanctification. And of course, sanctification can never be preached apart from the faith that is given by God. God has done all of these things for you. And therefore, we should love as God has loved us, right? That's what he says. Which is, which is why Luther set it up, as you mentioned. You know that you were dead. You know that, that you, you're aware of God's grace given to you through the cross. This is not, in a sense, this is not in any way uh, your love for others to earn salvation in any way. Right. But... You know, a healthy tree produces fruit. Right. Faith alone justifies, but faith is never alone. And I think that's, you know, the point that he's bringing out here. Number 10. Here, let us beware, lest Wittenberg become Capernaum. And the reference here is Matthew chapter 11, verse 23, where Jesus says, And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades, For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. So this is a great way of weaving in biblical uh, phraseology with contemporary reality. Let us beware, lest Wittenberg become Capernaum. And why does Jesus say that? Well, because most of the mighty works and preachings had been done in Capernaum. And he's like, look, you guys don't believe. You guys don't believe. You've been exalted to heaven. You've had the Son of God walking your streets. He's dwelt here. And yet, you don't believe his preaching. You don't believe his teaching. You don't believe his miracles, which corroborate that teaching. And you will be brought down to hell. And it's even worse. It's like, boy, if the mighty works which were done had been done in Sodom? (laughs) I mean, you know, where a bunch of men were going to homosexually rape two strangers? <laughs> if if what had been done in, in Capernaum had been done there, they would have repented. That's what it means. They It would have remained until this day. I mean, this is, this is powerful preaching. This is powerful preaching. It'd be like, it'd be like saying, um, you know, let us beware lest Hampton become Capernaum. Right? I mean, like, yeah. you could use this for any city. And you could use any other city, you know. Uh, if New York or Los Angeles or Portland, if these things had been done there, uh, they would have remained to this day. They would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. And so yeah. it's a beautiful way of not only bringing you back into the Bible, right? Mm-hmm. But it also brings the Bible forward and addresses it in contemporary clothing. That's why I just I love uh, a lot of the Reformation paintings in that because, you know, they're all they're all dressed like uh, like German peasants and nobles. And you can see like, you know, these castles in the background. Right. None of that's wrong because there's something to be said about having an imaginative reading of the Bible, of walking in these people's shoes and putting yourself uh, and putting, you know, Jerusalem as Washington D.C. Right? I, I mean, which is which is why I I've always uh, appreciated, you know, how every every uh, people like different countries or lands or races, they'll have a picture of the infant child, and it it if you, you know if it's a German, the baby Jesus is blonde haired and blue eyed, or in Africa he looks more African, and people say, well, that's not accurate. But in a way, it is. The, the point is he is born as one of us. Right. It's a theological point, not necessarily an accuracy of what the baby actually looks like. It's about who he was. Yeah, and I think just, you know, I think sometimes we've been so influenced by historical criticism 
that it's like, okay, yeah, this is history. This is history. This is history. Yeah, of course it's history. But it's history that was written for our learning, for our admonition. Like, the whole point of it is that we put ourselves in these people's shoes. And when Isaiah is being read to us in, you know, in the uh, in the church service, it's like, okay, well, is what the law that is being preached to me, is that me? Am I, you know, honoring God with my lips, but my heart is far from him? That's yeah. a good thing. I mean, this is this is exactly what people should be experiencing in the pews. Yeah, because you can so, you can super con- contextualize the gospels, for example, and say, "Well, this was Luke's audience. This was John's audience," and and get so wrapped up into that without remembering uh, God made sure this was recorded for your hearing too. Exactly, and so this is why I'm not completely opposed to some of the. Uh, like movie stuff that comes out. I actually like that 1970s uh, Life of Christ one. It's actually on YouTube. You can just Google it. Hmm. I mean, I, li- I, I like it. Is it perfect? No. No. I also like Greatest Adventures of the Bible by Hannah Barbara. Right? I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, they couldn't do that anymore, could they? No, they, they couldn't, right? But in a way, it gets you thinking about... Um, What's going on? That these are actually people. These are actually places. This is actually where I think uh, having a geography class in Bible class, so people actually know where things are, and what the landscape was like, and you know, like this isn't the fields of Iowa, right? This is rocky terrain. That's when they say when God is a rock and a fortress. Well, where do you think the Israelites went when the Philistines were coming? They went and hung out in the crags, and they went and, you know, protected themselves in the mountains. Right. Number nine. Dear friends, the kingdom of God, and we are that kingdom, does not consist in talks, talk and words, or words, 1 Corinthians 4.20, but in activity, in deeds, in works and exercises. God does not want hearers and repeaters of words, James 1.22, but followers and doers, and this occurs in faith through love. So the first thing here that I think is interesting, the kingdom of God, and he does say, we are that kingdom. We are Christians. This is what we should be. And what is that kingdom? It's not talk. It's not just talk, and it's not just words. But it's actually power. And we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20, where Paul says, for the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. And here, the context is, is that Paul's paternal care and chastisement of those who are divisive and puffed up in their knowledge and in their pride. And so he's saying, look, these puffed up people, you prick them, they're going to explode like a balloon. That's what they are. All they are are bags of hot air. Uh, The kingdom of God is not hot air. It's power. And so here Paul is lovingly chastising the Corinthians with these words. Shall I come with the rod or with the spirit of gentleness. So he's appealing to the Corinthians, just like Luther is. He's like, look, um, look, I don't want to come with the rod. I want to come with the spirit of gentleness. Do you not realize who you are in Christ? Do you not realize who God has made you? Don't you mm-hmm. understand that you're sanctified? Don't you understand that you have been reborn and you've been fashioned uh, to, a, to a new life, a life that is supposed to be zealous for good works? No, instead, you are being divisive. You're listening to hot airbags uh, preach about silly knowledge, and you don't show love for one another. This is why why a a fourth-year seminary student is so annoyed when he gets back, because they spent two years in the seminary where it's all, what, talk? (laughs) And then they go out for a year, and they actually deal with people. And not just talk, but put it, putting that the love of Christ into practice. And then they get back to the seminary, and guess what it is? <laughs> it's talk. It, I, well, I also appreciate what Luther's essentially saying, the way I heard it. Um, this is how Luther spoke to me in this, Berg. Um, is the fact that sin is bad theology. And what I mean by that is, 
theology isn't just your words or thoughts or being correct, which is something that we deal with all the time, right? Uh, yeah. I'm Missouri City because we're right. <laughs> and and yet uh, um, everything you do reflects your theology. Yeah. And and so uh, and so, you know how you treat your wife, for example, that speaks to your theology. How you treat your children or your neighbor that speaks to uh, you may know the right answers, but when he talks about the, the theology by which you live, yeah, that's different. How do you and, uh, how how do you lose a tennis match? That shows what kind of a Christian you are too. How do you teach? How well, do you treat the gas station attendant or the or the serving staff? Well, you know? well, it, if you lose a tennis match, that means you stayed with love. <laughs> oh <my goodness>. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Man. I didn't mean I don't mean to correct you, Bird, but well, two hundred thirty-five episodes or whatever. Now it's finally time to end. That's. <laughs> it's been a good run. It's not worth going anymore. <laughs> Clearly, we've hit the we've hit the uh, as low as we can go. Was call it quits, right? <laughs> well, I was I was thinking actually where I came up with that was from the uh, minister's prayer book by Doberstein. Do you remember reading mm-hmm. that? Yeah, yeah. And there's a there's a story in there or a reading in there about a about a guy he's a he eventually became a pastor uh but he was hindered from the faith for a long time and made it it made him struggle for it because with with the with the christian faith because this bishop was such a cad when he lost a tennis match <laughs> and you know he's like yeah my faith might have been weak at the time but shouldn't a representative of christ maybe lose a little bit more graciously <laughs> right you know, I mean, so yeah, I, I, this is the thing. Yeah. It's you know, and, and it's interesting from Luther's point of view is coming out of the Reformation. It was kind of the same thing, where you show your love to God by your thoughts and your words. You lock yourself up in a monastery. Uh, you do all these things uh, without actually being a good neighbor or a husband or a father or doing the vocations that God has given you to do. No, 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 no. That's not loving God. Loving God is just giving him all your prayer and attention at all times. Well, well, they would say, yeah, it's loving God, but it's really just kind of an inferior love. You know how you really love? You go to the monastery. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know how you really love? You give St. Peter's a big donation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, Patreon also. Yeah, speaking of, we have a Patreon, don't we? <laughs> All yeah, right. Unless that also t- changes their name to X or something. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, you know, uh, Luther brings up here James 1, 22. And it's interesting because, of course, we know Luther's, some of his writings about James, he called it the Epistle of Straw and everything. But he freely uses it here, right? He says, um, God does not want hearers and repeaters of words, but followers and doers. And that's exactly what James one twenty two says. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And so both of those uh, verses really do correct some of the deficiencies of the Christians in the Wittenberg congregation. And he still considers them Christians, right? Despite mm-hmm. their deficiencies, despite their flaws, he says, we are that kingdom. So even though there's all this turbulence and all this divisiveness and all the and all of these factions and all of this just infighting and strife, no, they're still Christians. There's a lot to work on, and there's mm-hmm. a lot that needs to be healed by the Word of God. But uh, it you know, makes me mindful of, of Jesus, the way Jesus would say, uh, "Oh, you of little faith." Is, you know, you have faith. It's just small. <laughs> yeah. Number eight. For a faith without love is not enough. Rather, it is not a faith at all, but a counterfeit of faith, just as a face seen in a mirror is not a real face, but merely the reflection of a face. And then the reference here is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, where Paul says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, 
but then I shall know just as I also am known. Now, it's really interesting because this passage is used by Luther in a way that we don't normally see. Here in the great love chapter of 1 Corinthians, we see that all of these gifts, all of these prophecies and the like that the Corinthians are sinfully rejoicing in and allowing to divide the congregation, all of that stuff will pass away. Even faith will pass away one day because it will give way to sight. And hope will pass away because it will be fulfilled. But love is the greatest because it will remain forever. Let us not deceive ourselves. Faith without love is not faith. It is a fake faith. I think that's something that doesn't get preached a lot today in Lutheran circles, that mm -hmm. you can actually have faith, fake faith. You can have... Can, can I... Yeah, please. Can I see how, how I, I often see this reflected? And I've preached on this too. Is um, on the one hand, there is some truth to this way of thinking, but we don't expand it. And this is well, what I, I'll say is, is this. Like uh, if we kind of make the whole church thing, I go to church so that I can grow in my faith so I can be saved. Certainly, yes. But it doesn't go any further. It, it, if it, in other words, this whole church thing is so I get to go to heaven. Right. And how do you see this? Well, uh, I, can, uh, I can do it uh, on, on my computer, on Zoom, so I can get what I need from it. And what faith does is because faith makes you sure of that, and, and hearing God's word and having receiving the body and blood of Christ— uh, is your assurance of that, it naturally direct, directs your eyes in love toward others. But I think oftentimes we get so focused just on that, uh, uh, the Christian faith is about me going to heaven. <laughs> and, and I think Luther would say, well, it's more than that. That's, that's, that's a vision, that's a reflection, not the actual. Well, and don't you think that that's also kind of, why it was so easy for people just to continue to stay away after COVID. Mm -hmm. Because we've been so successful and good at encouraging people to come to church because we've likened the church to a gas station, right? I need to fill up my tank. Which is true, right? It It is true. But then we don't actually, and honestly, looking back through the verses that we use uh, to have people go to church, I had never noticed this here until... Um, just like a few months ago, you know, Hebrews 10, right? Do not neglect the gathering of one another as some have done. And then what does it say after that? Encouraging one another. Like one of the reasons that we come to church is that we encourage one another. Yes. We build each other up. Like the church is actually a gift and you are a gift to other people. It is very encouraging to have a full church. It is very, very encouraging when people come to Bible class. Like, that encourages me as a pastor. It encourages the people in the pews. Um, I think, you know, people, this is why they get encouraged when they go to these big conventions and stuff, like the LWML stuff, mm -hmm. right? When they see thousands of other Lutherans and they're like, hey, God's word does actually work. And that's a good thing. Right? We should mm -hmm. encourage. Like when you say the Apostles' Creed, when you sing the hymns, people are encouraged by it. Mm -hmm. Heaven is already yours. So why come to church? Well, not only for yourself, but for others. Other, the other needs you. And I think this is so much more important today because the culture is going to hell in a handbasket. And I think it's actually more important for the church to have things like church softball leagues, potlucks, gatherings, and the like. Because those other things... They're we need, important. We, they're important. Let's, community is important. People are looking for community. People want community. And I think it's silly for us to treat people as if they're simply cars where, the gas, where they need to be filled up with gas. They have other needs too. All right. Anything you want to add to that? No. Yeah, I, I think that is that is all good. That the way we make 
a, a reflection and answering of the way we like to make faith a selfish endeavor. And it goes right back to the gospel reading we talked about, uh, Jesus having compassion. That if we want to talk about what faith does and looks like to the, the most perfect degree, uh, we would look to Christ. His concern was for other people. Yeah, and that he's given us all things, right? This is what Paul says, all things are yours. If everything is already mine, then I don't have to worry about anything, right? Mm-hmm. And, but, uh, people are afraid to use Jesus as an example, uh, but, uh, but I don't think so. I think if you, if you want an example of what the faith that Scriptures teaches looks like, you look at Jesus. When you look at, for example, the Beatitudes of uh, Matthew 5, uh, we talk about the blessed. It actually is a perfect description of, of Jesus and his life and what he does. Yeah. I mean, we'll always fall short. Our love will always fail. His love is perfect. That's why we're saved. Right. But nonetheless, being born again um, and bearing fruit flows from what Jesus has done for us. Right. And that's the thing is, if he's done everything for us, then we don't have to worry about anything for ourselves, right? Right. Number seven. Fourthly, we also need patience. For whoever has faith, trusts in God, and shows love to his neighbor, practicing it day by day, must needs suffer persecution. For the devil never sleeps, but constantly gives him plenty of trouble. But patience works and produces hope, Romans 5, 4, which freely yields itself to God and vanishes away in him. So that's what we see with Romans uh, verses, chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, where Paul writes, And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. So what this is saying here is that this strife in Wittenberg is pretty intense, but we should actually rejoice in it. Through this turmoil, God is teaching us patience. The strong learn patience by bearing with the weak, and the weak also learn patience by bearing with the strong. And together, both weak and strong have hope in the Lord who has set them free and redeemed them from the curse of the law. This is something I've always thought is that patience is a virtue that you can't learn on your own. It needs to be inflicted on you. And this is why Luther and other places have said that experience is the best teacher of theology. Um, this is why first-year seminarians don't have a lot of patience. <laughs> Right? I mean, yeah. sometimes you've got to go through the fire. you got to go through tribulation. Tribulations teach you patience. And by having patience, you have hope. So. Yeah, uh, a new pastor, uh, I was this way, and I think a lot of them are, when you're, you're going out of the seminary, your, your, your desire is to go to a church that doesn't have any sinners. Yep. <laughs> Where oh there are no issues there are no, no there oh, their theology you know uh, the the code word is always like uh, yeah it's a good good church or the way you know it's a he's a good guy <laughs> you know <laughs> you know I actually look back at some of my goals that I had uh, before I went to my first call mm -hmm. and I actually had it like a timeline and stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, I look, yeah, I, I look I, back I, I, on that. I remember I, I was I was your circuit visitor when you got first came. <laughs> <laughs> now, now this is not like this is not a reason for slothfulness or despair or anything no. else. But I do think that uh, what I've seen, at least in the last few years, is there are a lot of impatient young guys, and we need patience. Mm -hmm. You can either become cynical and hateful in, tribula in tribulation, or you can become patient and hopeful. And I, I, I'll give you, I give you an example of on a personal level, right? So, Vicar, let's, let's say you are someone says your pastor at, an, at a new place or something, and and someone comes. I, I'm interested in, in joining your church, and you talk with them, 
then you find a whole host of things that really would need to be addressed. Uh, your instinct might be, okay, um, I need to address these right away. Without ever actually showing patience and kindness and teaching them why, our, our first thought in our head is, oh yeah, there's some grave sins that we need to fix right away. But giving an opportunity to explain who God is, what sin is, teaching it in a way that they have trust and actually value what you have to say, um, you just can't just snap your fingers and say, oh, okay, uh, this person in this church, they, uh, they tell me I need to do all these things. I don't know. Why should I care about anything they say? You know, you have given them no opportunity for the word of God to be heard and to grow and to lead them to make, to, re, to reject sin and repent. That, too, doesn't mean that you welcome them to commute right away, but it doesn't mean that you have to, like, hit them with the law of the hammer right away either. You, you with patience, you give them a chance to hear it and learn it and uh, help them grow along the way. I, could, I can think of particularly uh, confession time for me is when I was for very first a pastor, of being in a situation like that. And, and uh, you know, I said, well, you know, this is kind of a, your life is kind of a messed up situation. You know, we really need to fix this. Without really knowing who they were, without explaining, uh, giving an opportunity to teach them uh, who God is, who Jesus is, what the Bible is, why you should listen to it, I never saw them again. Um. There was there's I didn't, there was no patience. I didn't take the time to to say, let's you you want to do this. Well, let's take t- the time to actually learn some of these things and help you make that decision, uh, and to to lead you to repentance. And that's a process. It's not going to come like in you coming to me and me just saying stuff. Um, and I think there's a natural tendency for a pastor especially a younger pastor, to just kind of hear these things. Oh, it'd recoil. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it It seems to me that a lot of, when a lot of people come with uh, sort of wrong beliefs about things, it's simply because they're misunderstood on what uh, the base things are. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, you can't hit, hit them over the head with everything all at once. You're going to scare them away. Um, in a lot of ways, it's sort of like teaching a small child, right? Uh, you can't just punish them for thinking or doing something wrong. You have to sort of take them by the hand and show them and lead them otherwise, because if you just constantly, uh, reprimand them, what do you get? But, a you know, a resentful child who doesn't want anything to do with you. Mm -hmm. Um, if you actually take the time to slowly teach and, uh, loving, lovingly care for them as, as their pastor, you, uh, create a very strong bond between them and the church mm-hmm. and between you and them as their pastor. Yeah. The other thing you can create is a broken slave, a broken dependent slave. And that's not what God wants for us. It's mm-hmm. not what he wants for our congregation members. He wants us to be mature right. in the faith and to be mature means to be free, free in Christ and the like. So, Right, but I, I do think there is a natural reaction, and, I, and I'm speaking from personal experience too, of of being so afraid of the roadblocks that sin has in something like that that you recoil. You're like, oh, you don't even want to try. You give up. Well, their sin, sinful situation is so great. I can never. And that, that that shows a lack of faith that God's word can do. Yeah, it's a natural desire to uh, recoil and not want to go straight into a difficult situation just to sort of kick the can down the road and let somebody else deal with it. Right. And just assume they're not going to hear me or that you're not going to hear God's word without even showing the patience and love and care for them. Right. From the beginning. It's kind of like a farmer getting mad at his field and being disappointed because his crops don't spring up the day after he plants it. Right. I mean, it, it takes time. And I can say that because Jesus says the the seed is the word of God. So, <laughs> <laughs> and most of you listening are probably in places where you can actually grow stuff. So, you know, unlike here, 
<laughs> You're not quite high enough ele- elevation to get some some green out there. Well, I'm. It's pretty green here in Lander, but all of the surrounding areas, it, it's pretty tough. So, it's definitely cattle grazing country. Oh, by the way, I thought uh, Wyoming for a while had a shot at beating Texas, but then they kind of got overwhelmed. I don't know if you're a Wyoming football fan yet. I don't have time. I'm too busy hiking and <laughs> being awesome. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, uh, Berg. We're gonna we got uh, we're halfway done. We're gonna do part two next time. Um, I'm excited to hear that. Uh, is, is there anything we can end on, Peter? That where can they find us, Vicar? They can find they can uh, email us at feedback at clericalareas.org. They can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash clerical errors podcast. And they can find us on Twitter. At me, bro. At clerical errors. It's called X now. Okay, okay, they can find us on X and they can... Also known as Twitter. <laughs> the artist previously <laughs> known as Twitter. <laughs> you can X us a question. That's right. Uh, this is Paul Hagen. This is Berg. This is Ficker. And maybe you have a little patience. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. This podcast is available on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Questions, thoughts, concerns? You can contact us on Facebook at facebook.com slash clerical heirs podcast. On Twitter at Clerical Heirs P for podcast or email us at feedback at clericalheirs.org. Thanks for listening to Clerical Heirs. See you next time.